Greetings and welcome to our third webinar on the HDP 6600 High Definition Retransfer Printer. We're thrilled to have you join us as we explore this incredible machine. We have a few settings I'd like to go through before we get started. Uh, my name is Nick Fleece. I'll be your technical trainer for today. I'm with special guest Jeff Stangler, our principal engineer. And before we get going here, I just want to walk you through the WebEx tool a little bit, show you how to use some of the closed captions, um, show you how to navigate the screens a little better, and use the question and answer uh, section when it's time for us to, to use that section. So before we get started here, I'm just going to share a quick presentation and walk you through the WebEx tool and some of those settings. All right, so the first thing we're going to cover is going to be the captions and translations. We have people all over the world joining this call. So WebEx is, can translate real-time captions into over 100 different languages. So to turn on the translations, you're going to use the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen there. And this webinar will be spoken in English. That will be the primary language, but you'll be able to choose the language you would like to see the captions in through the bar that you can see on your screen there. So whatever, whatever language you desire to see the captions in, you can select it there, and you'll see the captions in that language. So you can then hit the close caption button at any time to either close the captions, display the captions, you can have them on or off uh, essentially as you need them. The next thing that's really neat about webinar is in order to better view your main stage, you have the ability to move the translation window either out of the screen or to another screen, maybe to the top, maybe to a, an area that makes the main stage presentation easier for you to see. Another thing that will help with your, your view, because we'll, we'll be sharing the, the camera and the presentation for the full length of this webinar today, well, until we get to the Q&A section. Um, and if you want to make the presentation bigger, you can toggle that, you can toggle your layout into full screen mode, and that will, that will make the presentation larger and move the video, make it a smaller window that can either be moved to another screen, you'll be able to pop that out similar to the way you can pop out the captions or the Q&A. So Q&A, when it's time for the Q&A, like I said, this feature will be turned on for the entire session. Um, but we, act, we kindly ask that you save your questions till the end of the presentation because we will not be monitoring the Q&A section as we deliver the presentation. Um, we will save about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of this call for questions and answers, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out about the Q&A section is when you look at the Q&A, um, portion of your WebEx screen, you'll have the ability to send your questions to either specific users or all panelists. We highly recommend sending your questions to all panelists just to make sure that everybody has eyes on your questions that can view these and that your question doesn't get lost if you send it to essentially just one person. So the more eyes we have on it, the more likely we're, we're going to see your question and be able to give you an answer. And this is just a reminder, are these, these three webinars will be repeated by our team in Hong Kong. Um, webinar one will be repeated Friday, October 13th at 10.30 a.m. Hong Kong time. So for those of us in the U.S. or Central Standard Time, I'll just use that as a reference, that's going to be Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Or sorry, Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. So the first webinar will be replayed Friday, October 13th, 10.30 a.m. Hong Kong time, and that's going to be Thursday, 9.30 p.m. for us in the U.S. or Central Standard Time. The second webinar will be replayed Wednesday, October 18th, 10.30 a.m. Hong Kong time. Again, for those of us in the U.S., that's going to be the previous night, so Tuesday night, and if you're on Central Standard Time, it'll be 9.30 p.m. And the third webinar will air Thursday, October 19th, again, 10.30 a.m. Hong Kong time. So again, that'll be for us in the U.S. the previous night for Central Standard Time, 9.30 p.m. So just be aware of the time zones. Um, these will be live webinars. <clears throat> now, 
we also want you to check out HID Academy. We have plenty of trainings. Check out our webinar schedule. We'll have more webinars throughout the year. Um, we will also have these recordings loaded as courses onto HID Academy here in about a week or so. So you'll be able to go back and view these webinars as many times as you want, or for those, or if anybody missed it, you'll be able to view them through our HID Academy website. So now we're going to get into some issues that can occur in the field, what the issues are, and what we can do to adjust or fix the issue. So the first one we're going to get into here is card warping. Card warping typically happens when you have a single-sided printer because we're applying heat to transfer that film to the card. And in HDP retransfer printers, the card will always tend to warp towards the printed side of the card. So for example, if you're only printing a single-sided card, you're not gonna apply any heat to the back side of that card. So it's if you're applying too much heat, that card is gonna have the ability to warp or bend at the edges. Um, there are several options that can be utilized to reduce the card warp and jamming. Um, changing the print job's image <laughs> transfer temperature and dwell time, which you can see the image on the left here. That will help with card warping. Typically, we would like to decrease the temperature and potentially increase the dwell time. So that'll mean we'll, we'll reduce the heat that's actually going into the card, but we'll, it'll spend more time being transferred. So it'll spend longer a longer amount of time under the transfer rollers. <laughs> There's, is there anything else that we need to cover for uh, Card warp adjustments, or is it really just the temperature dwell time? It really is just the temperature that's and how much heat you're putting into the system. Um, I, I'll just make the point that it doesn't matter what you print, what image you print, it is completely related to transfer and putting heat into the card. All right, and the next field issue, chipping. So chipping is caused by either inadequate transfer temperature or heat to the cards, or potentially your cards are contaminated, maybe dirty. Um, yeah, so chipping again is gonna be trouble, or it's gonna be, I guess, fixed or corrected by messing, by editing your transfer temperature. So chipping is usually inadequate heat, so we're probably gonna go the opposite way that we would go for a card warp. So a card warp, you're gonna wanna reduce your heat for chipping, you may want to increase your heat to, to make sure the film is more is better applied to the actual card body. Um, chipping, you can see in these pictures, can be shown as little white dots or little exclusions. It looks like it didn't fully transfer the image to the card. Um, and that's what that that's what chipping essentially looks like if if you're having if you're experiencing that problem in the field. Um, we found that typically increasing the heat will, will fix that issue. Now, if your cards are contaminated, it's adjusting your heat is not going to do anything for contaminated cards. Um, so, yeah, and Jeff, is there yeah. anything you want to add to that? A lot of times you'll see uh, the top or bottom cards in your stack as you put them in. Okay. Those will typically have more issues just because a lot of times those are dirtier, you get fingerprints on them, and that's really where you can't, it doesn't get a good transfer to it because there's dirt, there's oil, okay. something like that. But usually uh, usually heat is, uh, more heat will help. And the next field issue we're gonna review are smudge. So I know that's not exactly the most technical term, um, but you can see here in the images what a smudge actually looks like. So you'll see in her hair or essentially the darker the darker portions of the card are gonna have like almost a smudge or for lack of a better term, maybe like a matte look to them. So they're gonna be almost like a matte finish. Um, and smudge is gonna be caused by inadequate transfer heat or a density setting that is accessible through the advanced settings in the driver. So maybe we're printing these images at too high of a density setting. So a few things can be done. Um, we can either go to the advanced settings that you see here on the left of the page, the image darkness, and we can decrease that by three to five. 
Generally, if you lower the density by 10, it will fix any smudge issues being caused by density. Um, if changing the density doesn't fix the smudge issue, increase the transfer heat applied to the card, which you can see by this image in the middle here. You're going to want to increase this offset. This can be done by moving the slider back and forth. Again, it's, it's also worth noting that each point on that temperature offset is, so if you increase the temperature by increments of five, you're increasing it by degrees Celsius. So it's not gonna be, so the degrees will be in Celsius if, when you slide the slider in the middle here. All right. And I do consider smudge to be a technical term, so. <laughs> And registration adjustment. So we'll get into the registration adjustment and how to account for potentially alignment issues or registration issues. But first, I just wanna show you where you can print your registration card. And, and this can actually be done through the driver, through our test printing in the driver, which we'll review here in a few minutes once we get to the driver. <clears throat> but this is gonna be the card you're gonna to wanna to print to check your registration. So this next slide will give you a little more information about kind of the issues we've been seeing or we have seen before and what a registration issue actually looks like. So you can see here, the yellow is gonna be shifted slightly above the other two panels. And you can see here that it's gonna be the magenta that's shifted, the yellow and magenta essentially is shifted up from the cyan or the blue line. So there's, one way to adjust this, there we do have some new advanced settings um, in the printer driver, which I'll show you on the next slide. And these are gonna be the yellow panel edge alignment and the magenta panel edge alignment. And typically by moving those, you'll be able to either adjust, and it's, it's also worth noting that it, however much you increase that value by, so say you increase it by one, that's gonna effectively move that panel the equivalent of one pixel. <clears throat> so if you can see by the previous slide here, let me just go back a slide. You can see here that we the yellow line moved up three by three pixels or because we increased that value to three. So that's gonna shift the yellow panel up just three pixels. So it's not gonna be very much, but it will be noticeable when you print it on this card. Jeff, is there anything you'd like to add about the about registration or what can be done to, to troubleshoot um, it? I will just point out, so this the setting that you're talking about, Nick, here is um, in the, I'll say, vertical direction. So short direction of the card, that's what this setting will, will help fix. If you see, let's say if the, the line that's vertical that you have on, on your screen, if that one was the one that was blurry where colors were not lined up. That's probably more of a cleaning issue with your printer. Um, but but typically this setting here is the one that you're gonna see where things get, I'll just call it blurry because the colors aren't colors aren't lining up with each other. Okay. So instead of black, now you see a yellow line above a blue line, that kind of thing. Great, thank you. And the next thing we're gonna get into are resin printing guidelines. So, in HDP printers, resin printing is very different than color printing. The type of material that's actually transferred to the, to the ribbon or to the film during the resin printing is not the same as color dye printing. So it's gonna be, it's gonna sit almost on top of the card and not go into the card body. So the resin you, is almost a plastic rather than a dye. So. Right, so if you have maybe sensitive fingers, you'll be able to kind of run that, run your fingers over that part of the card and you'll potentially feel that resin that's actually lifted up off the card body. <clears throat> um, resin is designed to print text and barcodes. So it's not really the best to use in image printing. We found that it, it's, it's really just meant for text and barcodes. So if you use resin to print color images or black borders, it's gonna result in really poor image quality. So if you use the K panel or the resin for in a, in a picture or maybe a headshot or something like that with somebody who has black hair or any 
black space in the picture, it's going to look pretty pixelated. It's not going to look as high definition as if you use like the YMC panels to, to print that image. So that's why typically we we only advise you use the K panel for barcodes, text, QR codes, something along those lines. It's not it's not intended for you know solid black borders around a card or to use for images. Jeff, is there anything you want to add for that? No, I think you got it. That's awesome. Been, that's it. So we'll also review here later in the driver, resin heat can also be adjusted. So we, if we need to adjust resin heat or maybe define specific areas of the car where we only want to print resin, um, we can do that. And we're able to do that from within the actual printer driver. So like I said, we'll get to that section here in a minute and, and kind of review that portion of the printer or of the driver. The next slide we're going to get to is going to be the F panel multi pass and resin scramble guidelines. Um, due to the printing process, these features have some limitations with this card printer. So each print job is only is going to be limited to four transfer panels. So essentially, you'll get four film panels per print job which means that if we're going to use multipass, so what multipass is, is after the film or the film is adhered to the card, multipass will go back and apply another layer of that trans a blank transfer film over the first one for just like an added layer of protection. So because each print job only gets four MTN panels, multipass is not going to work with resin scramble because what resin scramble does is it'll obfuscate the K panel of the ribbon. And in order to do that, it's gonna take another film panel and essentially render the K panel unreadable. So you won't be able to read any information off of that K panel off of the used ribbon in your printer. So being that, each one of those uses an additional layer of film on top of the film that on top of the layer that it's already used to transfer to the card. You're not going to be able to use some of these features together. So, I, you know, it's essentially going to have to be one or the other for if you want to use multi pass and resin scramble. And Jeff, is there anything we want to add to that before we jump into the driver and, and further explore? No, the not really. Some of these F panel multi pass resin scramble, they're very, they're very specific use cases. So, you know, I would say if anyone is having problems, you can certainly call our tech service because they are um, well versed in some of these, okay. how, to, how they work and, and how to improve anything that might be going wrong. Great. So that does it for the presentation. Now we're going to switch over to the driver and Jeff is going to walk us through a few of the features and some of the capabilities of the 6600 printer driver. Right, just give me one second here. Okay. All right, you got it. Yep, now we're ready to go. All right, so this is just going to be a quick run through of the driver. The HTB 6600 driver, it is, it is, it has incorporated a workbench into it. So there's no more workbench when it comes to the HTB 6600. That is part of the driver. So there's lots and lots of features in this driver. And I'm really just going to go through and try and hit some of the, the basic ones or some of the ones that are more talked about or more used. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna avoid some of these, especially the ones I don't know much about. But to start off with, I'm gonna skip, I'll skip the basic. Most of these are fairly, well, they're fairly basic, <laughs> straight to the point. And I'm just gonna go to the advanced area. And this is the driver that once you have the driver installed on your printer, or on your computer, you can get this through this through either the control panel or through printers and scanners on your computer to get to these screens. And we're just looking at the printing preferences. I want to go from left to right here just, just to make it easy. 
And some of these are fairly straightforward, again, portrait landscape orientation, um, dual sided, single sided, I'll just pick dual sided here. Um, you do need the hardware for some of these to work. Obviously, if you have a single sided printer, it's not going to do very well on, uh, on duplexing. Hard type. We went through this in a different webinar, but this basically lists off several different card types that you can use. And for example, I'll just use a premium card type. When I select premium out of there, what that does is it goes and sets up my image transfer settings. So all these settings in here are, are set based on your card type that you've selected. And to note, you do have to have um, the default selected here saying, yes, I want to use the defaults for that card and also premium mode. We highly recommend that one. It comes uh, as a default now. But once you do that, these will just be standard. On the lower part here, um, applying additional transfer layers. This is what it's sometimes called multi-pass. Right here, we just say a additional transfer layer, but this takes a blank film layer and puts it over the top of your printed card layers. Just gives it a little more, a little more durability. It's it's not equivalent to a laminator, but it will add it will add some durability. So I'm going to select OK there. Card flat, or I'm going to skip laminator. I'm going to go in here and I'm we're looking at this printer right now. It doesn't have a laminator on it, but I am going to trick it into thinking that it does, just so we can look at that. So now our printer has a laminator. And the laminators for this printer, this is a wasteless laminating system that goes with this printer. And it has a flipping system built into it, so it can do both sides of the card. What it does have is it has two material bays. You can you can actually buy it as a one material bay or a two material bay. And what that will give you is you can do laminate the front side using the left or right bays, back side, left or right. Let's go in here. There's a couple ways of doing this. So I'm going to just say front side, let's use the left, back side, let's use the right. One thing to note in here is that there's two different bays and they both take different materials um, or at least some different materials. If we look at the left bay, the left bay always will contain the, the chip card material. So it has a little cutout for the chip so it doesn't cover up a chip. Um, that material can only go in the left bay. In the right bay, if you have a mag card, that is where you would need, that's where your half patch would go so you don't cover up the mag. All the other materials can go in both bays, but those two are specific to those, those bays. We also have, you can use the laminator as a flattener if you wanted. Let me just say no lamination on the back side. And now I could say enable flattening. And really all this does is it puts some heat into the side of the card that we didn't laminate to, and it will warp it back into that direction and make it flat when it comes out. That's typically our laminators. I'll just set some weight. And then what are those uh, lamination temperature offset sliders we see? Oh, okay, here? yep, the laminator. I did miss those here. So laminator temperature, if your laminate is not sticking well to the card, if you can start to peel it up, you know, and it's not really well transferred, you can change your tamp transfer temperature for the laminated here by just increasing or, de you know, in this case, you'd increase it just to get more heat going into it to get a better seal for that laminate. And you can do that for material coming from the left or the right bay. 
select OK. And we'll just keep on going across here. Print modes, flip card before print. This really is, it puts the back side onto the front side. Um, I, I actually don't know what use case this would be for. Uh, it's something that we've had in our printers for a long time, and maybe some people use it. I, I'm not really sure. But disable printing is it will just not print the image. This could, um, again, I'm not sure the user where this would be used for. Um, maybe encoding. If you just wanted to use these printers for encoding, you select disable printing. And then you know it will not be using any material, at least as you're running cards to encode them. Next, we'll go to the ribbon color. Typically, the printer is going to see the image coming in, and it will, if you have it on auto color, it will it will know where to where to put the colors. So in this case, if we look at this job that's currently set up here, you know, I have yellow, magenta, cyan, and K panel on the front side, and the back is just K panel. Now I can go and change that. Let me just go manually select, and maybe I just, I don't want K panel on the front, and maybe I want yellow, magenta, cyan, and K on the back side. And in this case, I would force it into using this yellow, magenta, cyan on the front, and yellow magenta cyan and resin on the back. But typically, if you just select auto, it kind of it will do it for you. But in some cases, you depending on your card and what you're looking for, you might want to change that. So I just have that on auto. Moving over to the next one. So resin is as you as you spoke to earlier, resin is it's, it's kind of complicated. It's different than the dyes. It's a different material, the way it acts, the way it transfers. It is very different. That's why we say don't use it for pictures. Um, we do have on here different dithering types. And I would just probably leave this on graphics because that's good for barcodes, text, things like that. But if you did have a picture that you were trying to print in text, you can put this on, let's say, the photo dithering setting, and it will try to pixelate that image to get the gray colors and the black colors and make a decent image. Generally, you shouldn't really use resin. These printers aren't really meant for using resin on pictures. I want to just go to more settings here. Here's where it, uh, it gets a little more complicated, because why not? Depending on the program that you're using, if you use Photoshop, if you use Corel Draw, those are very smart programs. They're going to look at your image. They're going to recognize a barcode. They're going to recognize text, and they will automatically change those and use resin on those. So you don't have to do anything. It will do it for you. But in the event that you're using a different program that's just sending a picture, let's say it's some basic application, and it doesn't recognize text and barcodes, you might have to go in here, make some selections in here to say, use resin you know, on, to print the black in the images, you can set what you consider black, you know, this, that's the threshold of how black should it be before you start using resin. And you can kind of set that up. <clears throat> Typically though, if you're using Photoshop or something like that, you don't have to worry about this. But that is where you would step in and say, I have to do more settings on here to get it to print correctly like I want it to. I'm going to skip over fluorescence really quick here and go right to color intensity. These are simply basically the density, how dark your image is going to be, yellow, magenta, cyan, your colors. You can darken them up here. 
resin. You can lighten or darken it up if you want. You can do that through your color intensity. The next one here is color correction. Colors, have, colors are always complicated. Colors are, we have several settings here. We have default. What we set up as default is for this printer, we ran through and we said, if you're printing red, here is the best red that this can print. And we set that up so that when you hit print, if you're in the default, it will try to print the brightest red, the brightest greens, yellows that you can print. And that's what, that's what default will try to do. Legacy, that is if you were trying to match an HTP 5000 printer. So let's say you had another printer at your company and you said, well, I want this printer to look just like that one. You can put this on legacy color correction and that will, when you print it, the red that comes out of there will look similar to the red that comes out of an HTP 5000 printer. Vibrant is just another co color profile, not used too much. And then there's none which says, don't do any color corrections, just as it comes from the system, that's what you want to print. If you're using Photoshop, Corel, most every one of those programs, it wants to manipulate your image and change the colors as it thinks best. <laughs> So if you want to manipulate the colors in one of those programs, select none here, and that will stop our driver from changing any of the colors and it will just use whatever Photoshop is doing. Now, one warning on this is the program that you use, it wants to change the colors. Sometimes Microsoft wants to change the colors for you also. And then our program here will also change the colors so you have to be careful about what is, who is, which program you're allowing to, to manipulate colors. Potentially, if you're in Photoshop, it will manipulate the covers, colors. Microsoft will do some more manipulations, and then our program will add some more on top of that. And by the time it gets to our printer, who knows what you're getting. So you have to be really careful about turning those color compensations off or on and be very specific about what program you're using and whether it's trying to, to modify those colors for you. Colors are complicated, they always, they always are. Next, we have defined areas. So defined areas, I have a couple of them on here already, but you can go and select resin or color correction. I'm gonna just select a resin. Let's say you have card and you know you're always going to have a barcode on the bottom you can come in here and say i want resin to only be active only be active on the bottom part where i know a barcode is going to be and that way when you print resin this is the only area in your card where resin will ever show up all the rest of this if you have pictures up here Resin won't, it'll keep resin out of that area. Now I've added another one in here. You can add in more areas if you want and make this as complicated as you want. Um, maybe you have something else up there that's resin. Maybe your QR code is up there. But you can continually add shape and make it really adjust it for your specific card. You can also do keep out areas. Um, so if you said, I have a picture in this corner, and I want resin every place but where the picture goes, you can do that too. But that's what defined areas are, are meant to be for. Next up is security. So there's resin scramble and there's encryption. Resin scramble, I think you kind of you kind of went through that already. And so yeah, resin scramble essentially is just gonna obfuscate the K panel of the ribbon. So it's gonna make that text or whatever was printed to the card body unreadable. And how it does that is it actually takes another film transfer panel and renders that K panel unreadable. So if you have resin scramble enabled, it's, it's gonna use an additional film panel 
to render that unreadable. So you will use double the film panels if you enable resin scramble. And then encryption, that is, I think it's AES-256 encryption. Yeah. It just encrypts, encrypts the job going from your computer to the printer. Now, if we just go, I'll just continue. You can kind of see here it's showing. Um, let me go back. Let me just scroll. I'll just show this here. If we unclick, so I'm not clicked on anything, it will show us what it's doing on the front side and what it's doing on the back side. So we walk through this. We set it up so the front side uses yellow, magenta, cyan, and K panel. It's laminating, use the left bay. It's doing some, some things with, with the resin panel that we had specifically set up there. We're using resin scramble. And this shows that with all these settings that we have, it's going to use two film panels to make this front side. Backside we can see is the same way. Tells us what, what panels are going to be using, what lamination, um, dithering type for this security. And again, we're going to it's going to use two panels for this because it is printing a panel and then it's using another panel to scramble the resin so you can't read it on the used resin at all. So those are most of the settings in here. I want to step over next to some of these, the encoding and utilities. These are more what you'd use in Workbench uh, coming through. So encoding, for example, this has, this printer has a mag encoder in it. So if you want to, you can go through here and say, I'm going to just generate some sample data, but then I could say encode. And it will actually take a card, encode this data to it. And that way you can make sure everything's working with your encoder before you start running, let's say sensitive data or, or using really expensive cards or something like that. So this it's just is, a quick way to test out the hardware inside the printer, whether, you know, if you buy right. it with encoders, what kind of encoders. So mm -hmm. is there a, it looks like there's a place to test the smart card encoding too. There is. So this is mag encoding you can test that smart card encoding. Again, you can go through and there's several tests under here that basically allow you to say, is everything working like you want before you start doing <clears throat> jobs that may have sensitive data or really expensive cards. Next, I'm going to go to utilities here. And from left to right, some of these are some of these are fairly uh, obvious with clean printer. So you have Card path, it's got instructions and a button. Film roller, again, instructions and a button, start cleaning. Um, I tricked this into thinking it as a laminator, so it gives you instructions and a button. And it's also worth noting that in the printer driver or in the advanced settings, you have the ability to set the cleaning rate of the printer. I believe by default from the factory, that cleaning rate is going to be set at about 2,000 cards. So essentially, after your printer prints or produces 2,000 cards, you're going to get a message on the LCD screen of your printer asking you to clean the printer. Now, I know we reviewed this, I believe, on our webinar yesterday, but we can, we can clean the printer not only through the driver, but through the LCD screen buttons on the printer as well. The difference between those is if you clean your printer through the LCD screen, it's not going to get rid of that error message telling you to clean the printer. So anytime you have that message displayed on your LCD screen, best practice is going to be to come to the driver and clean the printer or kick off the cleaning routine actually through the driver. So that's our cleaning routines, calibrating sensors. Um, again, these are fairly straightforward ribbon sensors. There's instructions and again, the button to start calibrating. It has film. Calibrate the film sensors, more instructions in the button. And then this one has 
laminator, which instructions and then left and right calibrations. Our update manager. So I don't use this too much. I think Nick could probably use this. Yeah, so I do. If, if you need to update your firmware and your printers, this is where essentially you're going to go to the driver. Um, we have a button up there in the top left that will actually check for updates. Once you have a printer selected, my printer is up to date. If it wasn't up to date, it would actually go out to our website and download the latest version or the most up to date version of firmware. And from this, from this screen, you actually have the ability to update any printer down in the bottom left side. So maybe if you have a bunch of, let's say, printers on the same network or network printers that you can connect to, you can actually push this firmware to all the printers simultaneously and update everything at once. Or if it's just one printer you're connected to, you can download the firmware here, then it'll, uh, it'll install it itself in the, in the driver or in the printer that you select from the bottom left there. And you've apparently had three different printers at one time or another yeah. attached to this computer. So next up here, this is this is one that I, I use a lot, and this is just test prints. So from this, I can I generally select here's a common one that I select. I do this test card on the front, barcodes on the back, and then with this. If I hit print, all those settings that I did in the driver here, um, resin settings, keep out settings, um, extra panels, all that, all those settings, when I hit print, that's what it'll use to print a card. And that's how you can test, is your printer doing what you want? Did you get all the settings set up right? Sometimes I, you know, I, make sure that if I said on my settings that resin was only gonna be printed in this location, did I get the right location? Here's how you can test it. You can print a card like this, and it's you don't need any other program. You can just do this right from the driver. It's quite a number of cards in here, and you can get a pretty decent idea of, you know, Pick a card that maybe is similar to something that you're going to do, and then you can get an idea of will this will this work? Do we have everything set up on this printer ready to go? It has a few other features on here that um, I don't use too often, but you can see it's adding text and other things in here. But mainly, it's it's I use it to print test cards and make sure that it's printing as, as I want and that I had everything set up correctly. Going back to my utilities, we did test prints. Self-tests are another very handy um, screen here. On the right, I have all sorts of different tests that I can run. So for example, the, if you look at the top two, if I wanted to raise and lower the print head, I can just select one of those, hit run test, and it will run that test. So you could hear that I ran that test. So now it engaged the print head. If I want to disengage it and send it home, in this case, that's raising it. You can hear that I hit that and it ran, ran it back. <laughs> has a lot of tests in here, so there's a lot of good things that you can do. There's also self-tests. These are just different cards that you can run. Um, I would typically create my own test card rather than using one of these, but this will do things like print out a card with all your device settings, which can be handy. We also on the left-hand side here, there is, you can see the display. Mine is asleep, mine is asleep. Push a button. Okay, woke it back up. Now I can see what is on the display. In fact, I can hit the buttons here and I could work, work through the display as if I was there, but I'm doing it through the driver. Not very useful when the printer is sitting right next to you. Um, if potentially the printer is on the second floor and you're on the first floor, 
this could be very useful. The other very useful thing on here is, is sensors. This will show you every sensor in this printer and what its current state is. So I consider it less important whether it's a zero or a one or a three in here. I more just watch what I'd use this for is to see if they're working. So let's just, let's card in feed sensors, the first one. Sensor for card feed is right inside the card path. So if I put a card in there and I'm just gonna manually shove it in. Let's see. You know, it changed from one to zero. Okay. So. so it changed from one to zero. So if I pull this back out, it should change back. Zero to one. So now I would know that sensor is working. And you can do that with other sensors too. If, if you question whether a sensor is working, this is an easy way to work through them. Um, troubleshoot those and say, are they working or not? And it gives you a very quick, quick way of troubleshooting sensors. Next up, PRN viewer. I won't spend much time on this. PRN is just a type of file that gets sent to printers. And this would allow you to see a PRN file if you had one. And it'll essentially give you a display of what it looks like before you print it. And then you would have the option to send it to the printer to actually print a card. I want to do color assist. So color assist is if you want to match colors, this is how you do it. Um, I'll just select this thing and you can, uh, let me just pick something on here. Here's a, here's a bluish color. It will show you what the color is and, and you could print out swatches. You can print out um, different chips on this. And what it would allow you to do is tell you exactly what color that is. And then you could change your colors to match a specific color that maybe you wanted to print. There's a, there's a lot more functionality in there, but uh, I don't know it that well, so. Here we have internal settings. So these are the ones that Nick mentioned earlier. So internal settings are specific to a printer. So for example, if I look at image darkness, if I say edit this setting, I want to type in 10 for me. So if we put 10 in there, okay, it beeped, it took that setting. Yep. This printer will now print darker than what it did before. But if I select one of those other printers that you had in here and I print a job to it, those will not. So when I set internal printer settings, they are specifically for a printer. So this one will print darker than every other printer that you have of this type. And you can do that for all these settings, but you have to remember they are only for individual printers. If you want to print everything darker, that's when you have to go in the driver and those other advanced settings that I did. Okay. <clears throat> Set it back to you so, yeah. so I won't mess up your printer. Right. Next up, driver defaults. So all of those settings that we took, resin erase, where is it, the defined areas, um, single-sided, dual-sided, where is it going to laminate? Those are all driver settings. So they're specific to a job that you're going to send to a printer. And if you want, you can you can just save those settings. So I could go save and I'll say, yes, I want those to be my system defaults and uh, type in test pro. Yep. I want to hit save. Now, if I, let's say Nick is uh, in another country and he has a different printer and he says, I want to run those same exact settings. I could send that file to him and all he would have to do is open up that file, test profile, open that up, pick which printers he wants to put it on that he has at his local area and say yes. And then all of those settings that I set up there, 
in the advanced area, those would be on your printer too. So that way you can print the same settings and on across a large pool of printers without having to set all of them up separately. Now it is worth mentioning that those are just going to be the driver settings. It's not going to be those advanced internal printer settings or the EE settings that we're viewing here. So if you want to edit these settings here on each printer, you're going to have to physically go to each printer and change those settings. But the driver defaults or the driver settings, you will have the ability to save those settings in a file format and upload them to another printer so you have the same driver settings set. So there is just, I just wanted to clarify that because there is a different, there is a difference between internal printer settings and just driver settings. Good to know it. So I think we've made it through all of these, mainly those, I, I kind of ran through a few of these very quickly at a very high level. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, we'll go ahead and open the Q&A. Uh, we'll stop uh, sharing the presentation here open the Q&A and then, uh, yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A section of the of your WebEx tool and, and ask us away. So let me just pull some of these questions up, see what we got. Okay, again, just more questions about please sharing the presentation. Um, we will make sure this presentation is available on HID Academy. So this, the, the troubleshooting presentation or troubleshooting guide that we essentially walk through for these three sessions will be made available to the attendees and on HID Academy. Should also mention that um, there are, on the driver, you can get to user help files. I think there's also a user guide on the HID Global site. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, and there's also a user guide within. Oh, let me just share my screen again. Bear with me. So there was actually going to be a user guide in the driver as well. So in the help section of the driver, you'll be able to see some, you know, some good videos that we have too. How to convert laminators from one to two material. How to clean your printer supplies how to load material but if you click on the view help button oh it's on my other screen so bear with me it's actually going to open up the user guide for you it'll have sections here so you'll be able to go through um, if you need to know about specific error messages then we have sections here that tell you the error codes the cause and the potential solutions all right uh, let's see All right, just bear with me while I try to get read some of these questions. Oh, we had a question come in on how to save the driver configuration and use it to another printer. So we actually can do that. Let me just share my screen again. That was one of the last things we covered. So sorry that you, sorry if you missed that. Um, All right, so if you want to save the driver settings from, let's say, the printer that we're connected to now, we would just go to the utilities, driver defaults, and you have the ability to save all the settings that we just set. It'll, it'll give you a nice file. You can send that to somebody, or you can choose to upload it to whichever printers you have, you have connection to. You have to make sure you have the little save settings to a file box checked to actually make it. Make a, file. make a configuration okay. file that you could send to someone. Yep. All right, now let's see, we get another question here. Uh, okay, so we got another question coming. It's actually a really good question. Um, why should we not use resin to print the border of a card? So again, you don't want to use resin to print an outline or a border of an actual card because that's the resin when it gets transferred to the film more than likely that resin is going to be really close to that white film tracking mark and that could cause issues with the sensor 
because it may not, because resin is going to reflect that sensor just like the white bar, and that may start causing some of those check film errors um, if your resin is being printed too close to that tracking line. So there's a couple of reasons, like you mentioned, if you have it as a border, you might confuse the sensors. That's number one. Um, usually they're okay, but it can happen. Um, the other, uh, the other one is if you're printing large sections um, of resin. If you have this thing set up to print barcodes and text, and now you're printing blocks of resin, that's where it takes so much heat to transfer resin. That's where you can start to tear and break your ribbon if you're trying to print large areas of a resin. So it's typically best, it's, it's just, uh, we call it a best practice to use resin for barcodes and text and use the colors to print anything else, pictures, you know, borders and that type of thing. It's just, it's a best practice. Can you get away without doing it? Yep. Uh, we got another good question that just came in. So saved driver settings will change the inter internal settings of the printer as well. Short answer is no. So the saved driver settings are only going to change the driver settings if you send it to another printer. It's not going to do anything with the internal printer settings. So those internal printer settings, you'll have to touch essentially every printer if you're going to want to edit those. Those aren't going to be able to be saved and sent, sent to another printer. So what we showed you just a few seconds ago on how to save the driver settings, that's only going to capture like multi-pass or resin scramble or whatever you set under that advanced section of the driver. Maybe maybe you want to use more heat on the Y and C panels or use more heat, transfer heat on the K panel. It's only going to save those driver settings and transfer those to whatever printer you're trying to transfer it to. It's not going to do that with the internal settings. Good question though. Yeah. It's, it's not always clear on internal versus driver. Can be confusing. Settings code. Oh, for the IP address and MAC address? Yeah. So we had a question come in said, how do we know or how can we check or know the IP address or MAC address? Um, so there are, you can check it through, I think, the, the, the OLED, the front screen. Right. Um, you can also, if you go in there and print that settings card, that was one of the sample cards you could print. Um, I now, believe that has the IP yeah. and MAC address. So IP maybe is, some of those are a little different because if you have it um, DHCP where it's dynamic, your IP address can change. But the internal one, if you lock it down, um, that you can find through either printing out a self-test card, and that should list out right. your network network settings. Yep, and there's also a device settings card that you can print through the driver that I believe will still will show you your MAC address and your IP address of the card, as well as other settings like card count and stuff like that. Um, Now we got another question in here. It's kind of a broad question, so I'm not too sure where where to go, but I'll try to answer it. Uh, what do we do or how can we troubleshoot issues when cards get stuck or bunched up? And there's a few places cards, I guess, could get stuck or bunched up. I mean, if you just opened a new roll of cards or a new sleeve of cards, sometimes those have a lot of static energy on them and maybe they won't feed into the printer because they'll be holding on to each other. So it's best to maybe kind of fan them out before you load them in the printer if you notice there is a lot of static around that new package. Um, if this is talking about cards potentially delaminating or getting stuck in the card path during the transfer process, that's going to be looking at your transfer heat settings um, and your dwell time. So essentially maybe decreasing your heat and increasing your dwell time to kind of get rid of that delamination 
And really the only other thing I can think of is potentially the card fed in maybe two cards instead of one. And there's actually, oops, excuse me, Jeff, a setting on the back here that'll determine the thickness of a card that's gonna be fed into the printer. Now, these are always gonna be pretty much preset to 30 mil because that's our typical card thickness. Um, but that would be a place I would look maybe if multiple cards got fed into the printer. So hopefully that answered your question. I don't know exactly where those cards were getting stuck or bunched up, but there's, like I said, it could either be caused by delamination or that's probably gonna be the main cause for it if it gets yeah. kind of jammed in your card path. There are a lot of settings in there. And as you can see, if you change some of those, you'll get different failure modes. So it's, it's, it's always a little challenging to say, well, if you had a card get stuck somewhere, why did it do it? Because there's several reasons why it could. Um, and I think we have a troubleshooting guide. Do you see that's going to be on your on the site? Yes. Yeah, so we'll have the troubleshooting guide available for download or um, as part of HID Academy. Um, but we will get it out to all the attendees on these webinars just to make sure you have it for reference because it will be a good tool um, when you're supporting these printers. We just had another question come in. It's a really good one. Um, I can see that there's a ribbon called YMCKH. What is, what is H and what is that for? So the H is gonna stand for heat seal. It's gonna be a heat seal. It's just an additional panel to seal the car better. So I think that was originally developed for if you're using polycarbonate cards. Polycarbonate cards. If you're using special cards like polycarbonate, it's tougher to get an image to transfer. And that's where if you use the H panel, it will stick better. Yep. So it'll just for the general industry, not used too much. In fact, I don't I don't know if I've ever used an H panel, honestly. But if you have the right cards, that's where you need an H panel. Right. Hey guys, well, I think we've reached the end of our session today. So again, I just wanna thank everybody who joined. Thank you for joining. For those of you who asked questions, we had some great questions today. We appreciate your questions. Give us, give us a week, maybe a week and a half. We'll have these videos uploaded to HID Academy and available for viewing for, for everybody. So. Uh, also, don't forget, please stay tuned. We have our, our Hong Kong team will be running these live webinars again, starting, no, oh, I don't have the dates in front of me. So they will be, the, so it'll be October 13th, October 18th, and October 19th, all at 10.30 a.m. Hong Kong time. So make sure you, are aware of the time zone. So it will be different for those of us over here in the US. But again, thanks for joining. I hope you enjoyed these webinars and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.